This is a video about the importance of the work of people who share their thoughts, values, and experiences online. But before we can get into all of that, I need to provide some context. The story begins back before YouTube, before the internet, before agriculture, back when humans were hunter-gatherers. I know this feels like a bait and switch to talk about anthropology, but just bear with me, it'll make sense in a second. About three million years ago, our ancestors developed the ability to hunt things by throwing stuff, mostly rocks. Once we can kill at a distance, everything changes. Now we all have incentive to work together as a group. We can survive if we coordinate and all throw at once. Later, as the human race develops, this sort of cooperation bleeds into other areas of life as well. We start dividing a labor, we take turns watching for wolves, we pool our food together so nobody starves, we even start sharing parenting responsibilities. By cooperating and communicating, we make it possible to plan for the future for the first time. Our ability to exchange ideas and share information is what allows the human species to survive. Out of all the animals on the planet, we are the only ones that share what we're thinking even when there's no apparent reason to do so. And by sharing our thoughts and feelings, we're able to better understand each other, which makes long-term cooperation easier. In the beginning, our socializing was just a survival thing. It was pragmatic. We have to get on the same page if we're gonna survive together. And so, we evolved to seek emotional consensus with everybody around us. And at the same time, we evolve an aversion to being alone. This is what drives us back into our communities if we get separated for some reason. And that aversion to being alone is the foundation to what we now experience as loneliness. In our ancestral world, at the first sign of isolation, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in. That's the fight or flight one. The pupils dilate, the airways expand, and our heart rate goes up. Blood pressure and blood sugar levels raise so that we have energy at the ready. In a very real way, our body registers isolation as an emergency. And so the whole body gets engaged in this state of self-preservation. We narrow our attention to the things that are immediately relevant to our survival and pretty much ignore everything else. And included in that everything else is our more leisurely thoughts like desire and wonder and reflection. This physiological response to isolation is what produces the anxiety that we associate with loneliness today. And in aid of all of this is story. Even when nobody else is around, story provides us with a sense of connectedness and belonging. It eases that hypervigilant survival response. Story is how we share our thoughts. We encode our experiences in story to pass them along, whether that be through words, cave paintings, music, or in a modern world, YouTube videos. Told you I'd come back to it. Stories that are encoded in art are how we understand each other at a deeper level. They give meaning to our struggles. They comfort us when we're afraid or going through something. Story brings us together. And together is our default state, or at least it's supposed to be. For the past 20-ish years, Dr. Matthew Lieberman has studied this idea. He uses fMRI to watch people's brain activities while they're doing different tasks. Talking, hugging, doing math problems, and even just sitting there alone. He's found that social and non-social thinking are conducted in two separate networks within the brain. And we switch back and forth between the two. The non-social pathways are for doing things like your taxes or math problems. But as soon as another person is involved, our minds shift to the social pathways. And then when we go back to the logical problem, we go back to the non-social pathways. But here's the interesting thing. When we stop doing non-social thinking and we're kind of doing none of them, our brain almost instantly goes back to social pathways. In other words, we default to thinking through a lens of social interaction. When nothing else is going on, we yearn for social connection. But there's not just one dimension to social yearning. There's three. The first is intimate. Think romantic relationships. This is that deep sense of connection that we get when someone finally sees through our masks and personality defects that we project onto ourselves and onto the world. It's a bond of trust and affection. It's a sleepover where you stay up way past your bedtime telling each other secrets, except you don't have to go home in the morning because you're already there. Then there's relational. This is a yearning for quality friendship and support. And finally, there's collective yearning. This is a desire for a community of people that share your purpose and interests. 
and this is the one I want to zoom in on. It used to be that our yearning for collective social interaction was satisfied by our tribe. We had a shared sense of purpose to figure out what's for dinner and not die. And then once we had that all kind of figured out, it was satisfied by our town, and then our community, and our religious affiliation. Now, I may be alone in this, but I kind of feel like this yearning for collective socialization has been sort of diluted over time, or maybe polluted by noise, to the point where it's not really present in our day-to-day -day lives, therefore leaving us with some needs that are unmet. I know for myself, when I look past my close relationships, I don't really have a sense of alignment with my community. Not in a deep way, at least. Enter the internet. I think that as the world has evolved and diversified and spread out, we've moved our collective yearning online. I think the internet is the venue where we organize our purpose-based communities now. And I think that we organize them around people who are open and vulnerable and share their beliefs and values and interests with their audience. And I think that this is the importance of the work of these sorts of people. Organizing community in a way that fulfills our yearning for collective social interaction. Their work, their art, their stories become a beacon that communities are able to organize around. But there are thousands upon thousands of people that point a camera at themselves and talk at it. So what is it that leads us to establish communities around certain people, but not others? Let's look at this differently. Our brains process the world through story. Our senses just collect information that the brain uses to construct the reality that we live in. And anything that it can't collect through the senses, it just kind of makes up to fill in the gaps. The brain is a storytelling machine. And so what is story? At its core, a story is about a character. And the character, just like everyone, is flawed. They have a view of reality that's slightly distorted by those gaps we were talking about that the brain fills in when it writes our stories. Am I still making sense? Let me give you an example. Take the Lion King. Simba is forced on his hero's journey when his father, Mufasa, dies. But because of his distorted view of reality at the time, he thinks he was the reason his father died in that stampede. He blames himself. He doesn't know that Scar was the one that was responsible. And this distortion of reality with its subsequent impact on his worldview is character defining. And in the exact same way, the flaws and distortions in our reality are what define our character. Just as kind of a sidebar, I think it's super interesting that we call it character, like the character in a movie. Anyways, the flaws that a character has, the mistakes they make, are what make them relatable. That's how an audience is able to empathize with a character. And I think the reason for this feels pretty self-explanatory and obvious. Flaws and mistakes are just a core part of the human experience. And so we relate to characters that are flawed just like us. And these are the characters, or in the case of what we're talking about, real people, that we get behind. These are the people that we organize our communities around. It gives us a reason to all get together and say, we, as a collective group, believe this. It gives community a point of view. And it's this willingness to be real and human that cultivates this sense of collective community. The whole point of a story is to answer the question, who is this character really? Who is this person? And it's our drive to connect with people that leads us to seek out the answer to that question. And so when people are vulnerable and share their flaws, it's magnetizing. Now, as with anything, there's another side of the coin. When someone's work so gracefully displays their personality, when they're willing to set aside this drive to seem perfect and are okay with just being the person that they are on the journey that they're on, it can make the audience feel like they know this person. It can turn into what's called a parasocial relationship. And I think this is mostly an issue when we as an audience are struggling to maintain the other types of social yearning, the intimate and relational ones. And those are really hard to maintain, it's work. But when we're lacking in these areas, there's a danger of turning these stories and these characters into something that they're just not. Rather than trying to be a part of a collective social interaction, we instead create this sort of illusion of a reciprocal relationship with someone that has no idea who we are. Our minds almost begin to think there's an intimacy or a friendship where there isn't one. I've certainly 
made this mistake before. So I think it's important not to overemphasize the significance of online personas or celebrities or even fictional characters in our lives. We have to remember that the relationships we have with these people are completely one-sided. But the relationship that we have with their values or the ideas that they seem to stand for or the type of community that their vulnerability attracts, that's real. That's something that we can hold on to, something that we can organize community around, and something that can ultimately benefit our lives. A couple of years ago, I connected with this group of guys on social media, and we all had this kind of insane dream of riding our bikes across the United States. Now, unfortunately, the adventure ended up falling through because of some logistical reasons, but I think the point still stands. We all connected because we had been in the audience of the YouTube channel Yes Theory. The whole premise of this channel is to get out of your comfort zone and embrace the fullest expression of life. And so since we had been a part of a community that congregated around these values, we already had a common language. Rather than starting from scratch with, what do you mean embrace discomfort? We instead got to continue a conversation that was started within this incredible body of work. We already had all the context that usually takes this whole long-winded conversation to convey. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the value of this work is that it gives us a starting point. It gives us a direction. And then as a community, whether it be a small group trying to ride their bike across the country, or a larger group creating change for the betterment of society, we have the opportunity to pick up the ball and carry it the rest of the way.